everybody. Welcome back to Alan Wall's Photography. I am Alan, and welcome to our first Macro Monday. All right, that thing about Macro Monday, I made it up right then when I was trying to figure out what to say when I turned the camera on. But I like it, I like it. And it's particularly fitting because we're talking about macro today. I'll tell you what we're gonna do. So if it's not your cup of tea, you can go watch uh, pig wrestling uh, videos. I like those pig re wrestling videos. But anyway, uh, if it's not your cup of tea, you don't have to stick around, obviously. Uh, but I have got several um, emails from people who watch the videos, and thank you for doing that. Thank you for watching, and thank you for asking questions. But every time I do a macro video, somebody gets in touch with me and says, hey, what about doing a video for people who don't have those cameras and those lenses and those lights and everything that you have. And it's a really good point because I, I go on and on about how you can do this for cheap. And then when I'm doing macro, I'm using the, you know, the gear I sold two of my children to buy. Uh, but not today. What we're gonna do today is I am gonna show you the absolute rock bottom, close to it, cheapest way for everything cheapest cameras lenses extension tubes flashes everything you need to do controlled high quality and high magnification macro photography on your dining room table or in my case on my dining room table so let's get into it i'll walk you through the gear and i'll tell you why i chose what i chose and i'll as far as possible i'll tell you what it what it costs if i can remember all of that stuff so let's get cracking so there are three general categories of things that you need to think about if you're going to do macro kind of extreme macro even on your dining room table the first is your camera lens setup the second is your lighting and the third is your specimen or your platform. Uh, and they're all important. There are many ways to go about doing this, but the criteria I picked today is absolutely the, the cheapest way. And there are a few ties in here. There are things that are equally um, inexpensive. One of the best things that you can possibly do, if you're, if you're doing macro to the extent that you're actually going to try to do some focus stacking and get really high magnification on your images, you really ideally want to be on a surface that is absolutely rock solid. I am not because my house is not rock solid. It vibrates all the time. I think I'm probably on an Indian burial ground or something. Uh, but yeah, it's always juddering and shaking, but I'm just, I'm stuck with that for right now. But if you have an area that you like to do your photography, that's maybe in the basement or something that has concrete floors, unless you're in an earthquake zone, that would be great. If you don't, there's a, the second best thing you can do is set up your macro all on one surface, right? That way, if, if you have a tripod and then a stand with your specimen and then lighting stands and they're all separate and there's a, you know, the air conditioner kicks in in your house and things start to vibrate, your camera and your specimen might, might be vibrating at a different um, frequency, if that makes any sense. So to, to solve that problem after I, after I moved into this house, I built, I say built, it's a very grand way of saying I cut up a piece of wood. But this is a really good way to go about it. It's just made of scraps of wood. And all I have done is screwed a cheap ball head from an old tripod. And I've got these bolts here so I can put it on wherever I want. And then these little four holes are where my specimen platform goes. I'll show you that in a minute. But this way, it's got some rubbery feet on the bottom too. Uh, 
so that I can set this thing down and do all my macro right on this surface. And it's pretty helpful. It, it, really, it really helps. Usually my house vibrates mostly in the summer because it's the air conditioner. In the winter, it's just freezing cold, but the, the platform isn't necessary. So we're going to go with the next cheapest thing. Uh, and what we're going to be using is the entry level Nikon. This is a Nikon 3400, D3400, but I believe they now have a D3500. But whatever the entry level camera you have, use that. That's all you're going to need. It, so long as it has a, a, a changeable lens system, as long as the lenses come on and off, number one. Number two, as long as it has a built in flash. Whoops, there's a button for it somewhere. I haven't ever used this camera before, uh, recently anyway. But anyway, so long as it's got a built-in flash, that's all you really need. Now, one of, the, one of the key rules in macro photography is that you don't want to be touching the camera. We'll get to this in the camera settings, but you might end up having to invest four or five dollars in one of these ultra cheapo uh, remote control. All it does is fire the shutter. It doesn't do anything else. And in this case, it doesn't work either. So we're going to have to use a workaround. But anyway, so we've got the cheapest camera. And if you've been shooting a, a, a high-end pro camera for a long, long time, and you come back to this, it's really scary to know how to do anything because it doesn't have any buttons on it. You have to do everything in the menu. Uh, so, uh, getting it set up, I'll go through every step. The other piece of equipment here is a, about a nine or $10 set of extension tubes. This is to get my magnification. And I don't know if you watched the last video I did on adapters for, for lenses. We're, we're using some adapters here and I'll show you what they are. The, the lens is a 50 millimeter Nikon. Um, it's the uh, uh, F 1.8D, the old fashioned manual one, because once this thing's mounted on backwards, you can't change the settings with the camera anyway. Uh, and you wouldn't want to, you want to do it manually. So I set it for the aperture that I want, and this is real sharp at about 11 and uh, it's easy to get the lighting we want because we're going to be using, uh, I mean, the light intensity we need because we're going to be using flash. But I set it to 11. Now, these are the adapters that I've put on here. Uh, the first one is this, the reversing ring to F mount that uh, I told you about. It screws into the filter ring of your camera and then the filter ring of your lens, obviously. And then this piece can either fit in your camera or it can fit in your extension tubes because they're both, in this case, F mount. It would be E mount or whatever you use. Now, I have put one other thing on this lens. This is, this is entirely um, optional. I don't like having, this is a very inexpensive lens. You can get them used on eBay for well under $100, probably half that but I still don't want that rear element to, to be damaged by the, uh, you know, the, the banging it into the specimen or banging it into anything for that matter. So this is the BR3. If you can get one of these used or cheap, do so because they're stupidly expensive for just a, a hollow ring of metal. And I have put a, a Best Buy ultra cheap uh, UV filter on the front because this thing has got a filter ring in it. So that is to, that is actually glass there. So uh, it's protecting my lens. And this goes on just like you would uh, uh, attach a, a camera body to it. So that's the lens. Uh, $5 reversing ring, uh, $35 BR3 if, if that's the way you go, and a $10 UV filter on a 
under hundred dollar lens. And any of any reversed fifty millimeter lens will do fine. Or if you you're one of the people that's been talking to me about the cool um, uh, reversed um, uh, enlarger lenses that you've been buying, this would be a great way to use that. And your enlarger lens may have cost you even less than this lens. So that's it for the gear. All right, I'll put it all back together. This is the entire setup. Now, I've mounted it on one of those little Manfrotto tripods. I actually use this to mount my, uh, my voice recorder, my Zoom recorder, just because it holds things up off the, the ground. I've never put a camera on it before. It makes me nervous because it's, it's not very strong. I could never put a macro lens on this. The whole thing would just sag down. But anyway, this is, this is actually holding quite nicely. On my platform, I wouldn't have to mess with this. So it's a trade-off. But building that only costs a couple of dollars anyway. So that's the camera. Quick mention about the camera settings. We're using flash. We're going to be using very low intensity flash, very fast um, uh, flashes of light. So what we're going to do is to, to control the um, to control the brightness on our specimen. Uh, we're going to be concerning ourselves with the aperture, and we'll we'll set the aperture when we see how the flash intensity is. So what we'll do is we'll set our shutter speed at the sync speed of your camera. And on entry level cameras, it's usually pretty low, like one two hundredth, two hundredth of a second. All that controls is the ambient light, is how much light is getting in from, from around a bell. Uh, and in most people's living rooms or kitchens, there's not gonna be enough light to make any difference. The flash, even at low power, is gonna black out the rest of the world. Uh, but if it doesn't, um, you know, it, you can you can change the the shutter speed if you want more ambient light. But we're going to leave it on two hundred. I already told you that I manually set the lens at f eleven. I know it's sharp there. Uh, it also gives me a tiny bit more depth of field. That we're going to be photographing some really um, uh, fine tiny little object. So maybe this will be enough depth of field to actually get a photograph with everything in focus. Probably not, but that's the trade-off when you do a macro. That's another subject. What other camera settings? Because we're keeping this cheap, we don't, I, I don't want to use any kind of flash triggers or any other expensive piece of gear that you would need. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the camera's pop-up, non-pop-up flash. There, there you go. It does pop up. We're going to use this at its lowest possible setting. And you'll see in a minute, the light from this can't even get over the end of this, of the, the um, BR3. So the light's not really going to affect the image at all, but it will trigger I just heard a noise and it was my other camera focusing itself very loud. Anyway, um, using this allows me not to have to buy, even though the triggers for the flashes I'm using are not expensive and they work beautifully, this will, this will do. And I already mentioned that um, we're, we're not going to be using a shutter trigger because mine is broken. And amazingly, this camera, uh, it's an inexpensive camera, but it's still, it was still a few hundred dollars, does not have a plug to plug in a remote control, a shutter release. There is no mechanical or electrical shutter release. Whoever thought that was a good idea probably doesn't work there anymore. So the only way that we're going to be able to keep movement from our camera is to use the shutter delay. It's got a two second and a three second and a five second shutter delay that you set by pressing buttons on the back. So that's what we'll do. So when I fire the shutter, hands off, it'll fire. 
The flash will go off at minimum power, which for this camera is only one thirty second power. But even at full power, this thing doesn't put out much light, but it'll be enough to trigger these two. So let's talk about flash. Have I missed anything about the camera? Set your white balance to flash. Set your, um, your picture quality to raw. Don't take JPEGs now because you're not going to be able to edit them properly. Shoot in raw. Um, and uh, if need be, we can do a bit video about that later on. That's, every, that's everything. I've covered white balance. Yep. Okay. All right. Good. So we'll put the camera out of the way for a minute. And uh, by the way, this is another option for the tripod thing. If, if you, you don't want to buy one of those $20 Manfrotto tabletop things, you can buy these bendy leg things at um, uh, Best Buy and places like that. I think it's just terrible unless you're unless what you're putting on top of it weighs about as much as a tea bag i wouldn't trust it because it just kind of gradually sags as if you put a big camera on it 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 literally collapses what i do use this for is i i've got a thing for an iphone because um a little clampy thing that uh, uh, an iphone or a you, uh, a uh, GoPro fits in and I like to hang this from trees when I'm doing videos outside. It's great for hanging. It's not great for standing up, which is a bit of a shame for a tripod. Okay, flash. These are called TT600s. I don't know that they still make these. The reason I got these is they are very inexpensive. They don't have fancy lithium batteries that you can recharge in the cat in the flash, like some of my other speed lights do. But they're powerful, they're flexible, and they work. When you tell them to flash, they flash. And we're gonna set them both up in slave mode. If you don't know how to set up a flash in slave mode, read the, the book, they're all about the same. Uh, use the S1 slave mode. The S2, what that does is it, uh, it's if you're, if, if you're using a, a light to, for your camera to help focus itself, then it, it puts out a flash before the flash. And if you don't have it set on the right setting, your flashes will go off too early. So set it, set it to the S1 setting. And these are just operated by these little rechargeable AA batteries. Everybody raves about these things, Eno loops. I think they're just terrible. They, they don't last at all. But that's just me. Everybody else thinks they're great. I might just have a bad batch. If you've only got one of these, Fine, use one of these and um, something that you can use as a flash card or a mirror. I'm gonna be getting to this in just a second, but just a white piece of card can be your fill flash. When we talk about the specimen, I'll show you where you put the flashes, but you could use this as your second flash and bounce light back into the other side of your specimen. But we're going uptown today and we're using two, a fill flash, uh, and a key light. And I'll show you how we do do this. The settings, usually I will go with about one 30 second power in one of these, and then one 64th power or even one 128th in the fill light. The reason I use two lights, one from each side and usually slightly below, is because when they're lit like that, the, the lighting's kind of dynamic. It's like taking a picture of a human being. You get a much more uh, immediate sense of depth and uh, you know, feels the, the, your specimen just looks more alive and full and complete when you have that contrasting light, but with enough light so that nothing is lost in, in shadows. There are a million ways you can set these up, but for the cheap way today, that's what we're doing. So two cheap flashes, anything you've got 
set in slave, one at a low power and one at half of that low power. You can even do them at the same power if you want. It just has a tendency to flatten the, the image. Light modifiers, super important. And I have got every light modifier that's ever been made. First off, it comes, all of these flashes come with a, a modifier. It, it's this little Fresnel Fresnel uh, light sprayer. I don't really know what it does. It doesn't block any light though. Um, I think it just spreads it out some more. This is a, a, a directional card. Don't worry about any of that. So that doesn't count. But almost all flashes come with one of these plastic cups. They're pretty useless. They you can cram it onto the end like that, and really you still got a harsh, very bright, very directional light. But that that that's one way that you could go. For less than two bucks, you can buy these didgeridoos on from one of those Chinese shops on Amazon. I mean, not Amazon on the internet which has got, uh, they're, they are so cheap and rubbishy, but the material in them is actually nice diffusing material, or it looks like nice diffusing material, it's just cheap. And then it's black on one side and white on the other, and it's got a shiny silver insides on the black part. So you can put these, like you're putting on your shower cap in the morning, does anybody wear a shower cap? This wouldn't fit my head. That's, do I have to do this or do you get the, the idea? It does fit on, but I'm not gonna mess with it. So it fits on there. And then as you, you can position the flash up in the air like this, and most of your, your light then is gonna come down. It, and it diffuses it a little bit. I've never used them. They came as a free gift with something that I bought. The next step up are these mini soft boxes. And I actually like these when I'm out in the, the field. I always have one of these around because they're super portable. It, they're lined with silver, not real silver, tin foil, and they have a, a lovely diffusing panel. They come in three different sizes. This is the smallest. I got mine from Altura. Very, very inexpensive, but they've lasted for ages. The cool thing is on the inside, they have a second piece of diffusing, uh, diffusion material that has got a Velcro in there. I don't know which camera will show this better, but uh, it's got a little piece of Velcro that goes across the front and adds an, another layer of diffusion. And these things just go right on the end of your flash and it's got a, a stretchy elastic band around it like so. Now, these are nice. At very low power, they diffuse, they're far enough in front of the, the bulb to, to do a really nice job. Uh, so this is one thing to think about. But if you, if you absolutely don't want to spend uh, that money, and I think I, I got a set of three of these for $11. So it's, they're not that expensive. Listen, you can use a sheet of tracing paper. Just hold it up in front of the flash when you get it set up, that'll diffuse it. Of course, the best solution is to use one of my homemade Speedlight diffuser boxes. If you haven't seen the video on how to make one of these, you have to do it. Um, if I can figure out how to do it, it'll be there or there. I'll show you where it is. But yeah, I make these things um, and I've got a video on how you can do it with just junk, basically. Tin foil, glue, old bits of um, Velcro, and then milk jugs that I cut up into pieces. And these things absolutely are brilliant. They, uh, they're designed to fit into your speed light, like so. And they give 
directional soft light. And for tabletop macro, they're the uh, bee's knees. They really are fantastic. Watch that video. It's, I impressed myself with that video because I'm not much of a man about the house when it comes to sharp tools, but uh, I did this without much blood loss. That's it for the lights. Best, and you'll notice that we're not using any fancy hold it, things for holding your lights up in the air. We're using the thing that comes with the flash in your pack, the uh, little legs on it. All right. So we have talked about the camera and the lens. We've talked about the flash and how to set them up. Now we're going to talk about the specimen. And that's actually important. Unlike most kinds of photography where your subject is kind of doing whatever they want to do, be it a model or a building, you kind of plan your photography around the subject. In macro, oftentimes you'll find yourself moving the subject around while your camera and your lights stay steady. It's just, we're talking about such tiny distances that the usual techniques of you know getting the focus almost right but not quite right uh, may be fine on photographing a building, but it's not going to be fine focusing on something a millimeter thick. But I I bought one of these. This thing, which I hope it shows up better in this other camera. This thing is a, it's called a laboratory platform. And they use it, the boffins in the labs, use this to raise and lower their flasks or their, their tools or whatever they're using. And it is a really cool way to, to adjust the height of your specimen because it's so critical and we're talking tiny distances. This thing's dirt cheap. I got it from a Chinese company. It took ages to get here, but it was well worth it. I clip a piece of black fabric on top of it just to uh, keep too much light bouncing around from the metal. But this is handy. You'll, the four holes that I had in my, um, my board setup, the four holes were for these feet. They fit perfectly in there, the exact same size, so it can't move, which is handy. Something I didn't talk about, by the way, I brought this out of the back to show you. This is a very inexpensive focus rail, two-directional focus rail. The, uh, the rail moves backwards and forwards and also in the other dimension. This was initially bolted onto my board. And the reason I use this is in what I'm doing manual focus stacking, which is a, another subject to talk about. But I wanted to show it to you because if you got one of these, they, and I just bolt this to a piece of wood so it won't fall over when I'm not using it, but you could actually use this to mount your specimen if you wanted to, because it's got lots of control. Just thought I'd show that to you. So I have, I have developed a lot of preferences about how I um, present my specimen, whether it's an insect or a, a little flower or you know anything I want to photograph. Um, I, I, I sometimes like to photograph uh, gadgets like electronic stuff that I smash open to see what's inside it and then photograph the bits. It broken stuff, not I don't buy a new thing and smash it up. So with this table, I can control the, the height and obviously I can slide the table around for the position if I need be, but I need something to hold my specimen up in the air. That's key to allow the lighting to get to it in the, in the most advantageous way. And I've got tons of ways I do this. One is this little chap is a, is a block of wood, a scrap of wood that I drilled a hole in and put a little piece of salvaged metal 
I think it's brass tubing in there. And now I pinched a buffalo clip on the end, just squashed it into that. This is fantastic for putting on my stand and I can, I can clip things to it and then, you know, I have them completely up in the air with my lighting coming from all sides. So that's a cool way to do it, but you don't even have to, if a scrap of wood is out of side of your budget, buy a, um, buy some of this stuff, this foam board. You can get it at Walmart for a dollar for a big sheet of it. And just by gluing a stack of this together, you've got something that's really solid. You're going to need some pins, whatever you're photographing. I've got a whole blog article on my website about the right pins and the best pins and where to get them and everything. Uh, but these pins will stick into to the white foam board beautifully and they'll remain completely fixed in that position. They don't move. So this stuff's great to have. It's also great if you Oh, I see that flashing in the lens. Sorry if I just blinded anybody. But this, um, you know what this is? This is a party bag that came from a Dollar General store. They had them on sale. I wonder why, probably the color. But uh, I bought uh, three or four of these bags. They're just shopping bags, carrier bags. But if you carefully peel them apart, they've got tons of this material metallic material and I glue it to all kinds of things to use for uh, reflections like accent reflections and product photography that type of thing but these are great for macro if you've got only one flash you could bring the flash in from one side and then bounce some colored light back in from the other interesting a lot, lot of things you can mess with there these are gift cards If you want to give me a gift, I'll fill out the card for you and then I can keep it when I'm done. But uh, these are fantastic because they stand up on their own. Voila. Uh, and they give a lovely high reflective surface as well. So go to just go to one of those dollar shops and wander around and you'll see all kinds of stuff for holding specimens. I like using a solid pencil eraser hold the pin really well and it's solid it'll stay put even with a big specimen um, the stuff that came with your the last piece of camera gear you bought the foamy stuff on the inside fantastic it'll it, it holds pins and you can you, you it's light though it has a tendency to move around and if you get any of this in the picture it looks terrible so that that's one thing you can use this is um colored wrapping uh what film i think that's what they call it at the hobby shops and the wrapping shops you can buy rolls of this. I mean, gigantic rolls in every color under the sun. And these work brilliantly as gels for your, uh, for your speed lights. Um, so I just mentioned that because I saw them in the box. But you, you can get blue and yellow and orange and green and, and anything you want for creative lighting effects. That, but that's really not to do with the specimen. I already told you about the, the board. I can't tell you enough how this foam board will come in handy for, for bouncing light. So definitely, definitely invest in a sheet of that. There's one other thing that is a must that you have to get for managing your specimen. And that is this stuff. I don't know what it's called. I used to call it blue tack because it was blue. This is not blue. Do not adjust your set. It's, um, it looks like chewing gum. It does not taste like chewing gum. I tried it. it. It really, it looks like minty chewing gum, but if you mash it around for a little while, I think this might be a bit old, but it'll eventually start to get 
soft like um, Play-Doh or plasticine. But once it gets to the right consistency, this is the best stuff in the world for like it'll it sticks to anything and then you can use it to position pins at very you know particular angles and this stuff is malleable and it's just it's just brilliant uh buy some of this i bought uh, one packet of this about a hundred years ago and i've still got one sheet of it left it comes in like four sheets it you just i reuse it over and over again this is a different brand a little stretchier but it's no that's chewing gum <laughs> anyway you get the idea so let's set up to do a shot with this dirt cheap setup okay what i'm going to do is i'll um i've got this uh this doesn't look like much now. It's just a tiny little piece. Sorry about the noise from that focusing device. It's just a little piece of wire, but you'll see that it's got some some detailed um, details in it when we photograph it. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to pinch it into my little grabber thing like so. So that it's fairly up and down so it will stay in focus position it on my table so that's the specimen fixed if i was putting a, a, a dead insect if i had if i'd found a house fly and wanted to to photograph them um, i would attach them to one of these tiny pins and then i'd grab the pin with the tip of those jaws and now you can see just how uh, accurately you can hold the, the specimen. But we're not gonna we're not gonna do that. It's winter. The the flies have all gone to uh... where do flies migrate to? Don't know, but they're not here. So we'll clip this thing in, and let's set this up. I'm gonna do it over in this direction so the camera can see it. Now, one of the reasons I put the, the BR3 adapter with the little uh, glass filter on the front is because working distances, uh, even with this setup are very, well, particularly with this setup are very, very short because of the extension tubes. So what I'm gonna do is I, I hope that this is showing up clearly in the other camera. I am going to lower the, the specimen until it looks like it's about at the level of the middle of the lens, okay? And I'm gonna set my aperture for, uh, it's already set to 11, that's fine. And you'll notice I'm not gonna touch the focus ring on the lens. For one thing, it's a super cheap lens and it kind of, it's a little sticky, the, the focus ring, and it's far too coarse of a, an adjustment. What we're gonna do is we're gonna slide the camera or the specimen to get it in focus. So I'll turn the camera on and I'll put on live view. Tell you what I'm gonna do to, to get this thing focused, I'm going to open the aperture all the way up all right so once we get it in perfect focus and we're not going to talk about focus stacking or anything else we're going to try to get this thing so it's just perfect in one shot then what we'll do is we'll take our two flash devices. Here's, here's one. We'll turn it on, make sure it's in slave mode and set it to, we'll set this one to uh, a 16th and see, see what we get. Now, it's a good idea to take a picture uh, with, to take a picture with one light see what it looks like, 
and then add the second light. That's a rule whenever you're doing flash photography. If you're adding lights, do it one at a time. Figure out what your, your uh, image needs after you see it with one light. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to position this light at about 45 degree angle, just in front of the edge of the, the filter there. Okay, so this is gonna be my key light. So we'll start at about 1 16th. I'm happy with the focus on the specimen. I'm gonna use that timer thing, two second timer. There you go, I didn't press it hard enough. Now you're talking. All right, so I wanna move that light a little bit Closer in line with the specimen, we'll shoot another shot. Oh. You have to set the timer every time you take a shot. Lovely. Now we'll take light number two. It's identical to that one. We'll turn it on. I'll put that on 164th. So this is going to be my... And I hope that other camera can see it. It'll at least see the back of it. So now we've added the second light uh, at 164th of a uh, 164th power. We'll see what that looks like. Perfect. So that, my friends, is all there is to it. With with this setup like this. You can experiment to your heart's content. You can try every kind of creative uh, lighting uh, possibility that you can think of, like using the colored reflectors, adding a third light, trying it with one light and a mirror. And as you're gonna see uh, from the photographs that, that uh, I'm showing you here, this is not a garbage setup. It takes really good pictures and you get really good magnification. Uh, so this is, when I first started out, it was with a cam camera similar to that. Well, not really, it was nothing like as nice as this, but just with some extension tubes and a cheap plastic lens, I was able to get a lot of really good pictures. It comes down to attention to detail, making sure that, uh, making sure that you check everything twice and keep doing it. There's a lot of practice that will help you get better and better pictures from this setup. But this is rock bottom. I don't think you could do it any any cheaper. Uh, of course, with, with the uh, flashes, you could do it cheaper without flash using natural light. And that's, that's fantastic. But that's not the, that's not the point of, of today's discussion. This is how to, to do it, you know, dirt cheap. One flash, the cheapest camera you can get, extension tubes and a, a lens reversing ring. Forget the BR3 and the, and the lifting table and you can be good to go with that, which is what, under $100, um, $103 if you build one of these. You've got to see that video. <laughs> All right, that's it. That's everything. I'm sorry it went longer than it was supposed to. Listen, I, I know there aren't a lot of you out there, um, but those of you that are, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate it. I looked at the number the other day and it's 250 people that follow my videos. That is a big deal to me. It really is. I did some research. I only need another half million and I can actually make money doing this which probably isn't going to happen in my lifetime so what I have done is I've set up a patreon account but just in case uh, anybody wants to, to kick in a little bit to the cause I'd appreciate it because this has become my full-time job now and uh, I love it, love it more than any full-time job I've ever had, but uh, I know what a starving artist is now. Check out the website, 
alanwallsphotography.com and uh, you can see everything that's going on there. And I'll be back in just a few days. Thanks again, have a good day. I'll see you again soon, goodbye.